Hey, everybody. Hey, Annabelle. Hey, Eve. Cool people here. Well, it says zero on my counter. Um, let's see. Banners. Let me get set up here. There we go. And anybody want to join? How's everybody been? How was everybody's Easter? Um, anybody want to come on panel? There's the... Sorry, my cat just walked by me. There's the um, link. Love you, Eve. Who could not love Eve? Love you too, Annabelle. Oh, yeah, you stayed in. Oh, boring. Well, I got home and spent my time cooking. We had turkey, um, green bean casserole, dinner potatoes, corn pudding, uh, make a head salad. That's a seven layer salad, kind of. And um, Watergate cake, pistachio cake. Peas and peanuts. Yep. I think that's it. I think that's it. We had a lot of a lot of food. And uh, food and potatoes, I had to do a poll on whether or not to put uh, cornflakes on the top. Because I had never done that before. But it turned out pretty good. I always stress, I'm, I don't know how to cook meat. I don't cook meat. So I'm doing it strictly by package instruction because I've never learned how to actually cook meat. So I stress incredibly over getting everything timed exactly right and hot and on the table at the same time. How the heck do people do that? I even had trouble fitting in the oven. The roasting pan was on one rack and three casserole dishes, one nine by 13 and two smaller ones were on the top shelf and I couldn't get the door shut at first. I had to adjust the handles. Um, you know, we always had two ovens um, when I grew up. So you now I used to having to do Sudoku, not Sudoku, but what is that cube? Rubik's cube, that's what I did. Hey, Bob. Oh, Texas Roadhouse is good. Everybody loves Bob. What is it about you, Bob? Everybody loves Bob except for PG. <laughs> but we're not going to talk about her. Although, uh... Hi, Millie. Welcome. Us Puerto Ricans don't measure anything. Um, you mean when you cook, you don't measure anything. Yeah, I know people that do that. Just a pinch of this, a pinch of that. That's kind of like how my grandma used to cook. I don't know enough about food science to fiddle with the recipes. I think that's why I love watching like, you know, Top Chef. Just to watch them give them, like, uh, have to make a gourmet meal out of, you know, $5 worth of food from a vending machine. I mean, and watch, I'm like, what the hell? <laughs> it drives me crazy. Um, PG secretly loves, she might. You know, that's a thought. She might, Annabelle. Because you know how she loves Don, and she turned on him. Bob, did you, like, you know, reject PG at one point in your life? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Hi, Melissa. Oh, I bet uh, Puerto Rican food is really good. I bet you, Millie. When am I trying to think? Oh, I like Cuban food. I like that mo. Mojito sauce or whatever that is. Mo. I don't remember now. I have some in the kitchen though. 
Um, yes. Or what about Bob? Remember that movie? What about Bob? <laughs> what about Bob? Um, I don't think I know anyone on here. Oh, well, welcome, Millie. Um, you'll like it here. I hope. Um, you know, we just talk. Everybody's very friendly in chat. We don't have any trolls or any trouble. All opinions are welcome. You don't have to agree with me. You can, uh, you know, say whatever you want. Lucia, you're full of BS. <laughs> whatever. I don't take offense. Oh, uh, you know, I don't cook a lot either, Eve. Um, I used to. And I need to start because, I mean, I'm buried under DoorDash boxes and bags. Um, yeah, I need to. <laughs> shrimp for dinner? Shrimp? Is that what you're having for dinner? I was going to say, isn't it kind of late for dinner? But no, I guess not where you are. Oh, no, we don't bash anyone here we go strictly by facts in this group um so um thank you e yeah we go by facts so you know good and bad you'll hear us talk good and bad but um you know all all possibilities are open we don't blame parents for doing anything to their missing kids. Squirrely girl. Hey, hon. <laughs> I fell out of my tree. <laughs> Wait a minute. I'm all, oh, I forgot to say hi, Chris, because I was just chatting with you. Hi again. <laughs> um, call Eve, you're so sweet. Hi, Kay Dan. I was happy to see you. Do you remember the... <laughs> <laughs> now you're going to offend them. <laughs> you're going to offend uh, <laughs> Bob. <laughs> yes, nobody should. And no mention of carrots. We don't allow carrot mentioning anything. <laughs> Yeah. Yes, Chris. Um, Millie, Chris is uh, Rose Bly's ex-husband, who is Summerwell's missing aunt. Um, you know, and he'd like to see that case solved too. So we talk about that occasionally. <laughs> yes. Hey. <laughs> Bob, um, what's on wrestling tonight? <laughs> I appreciate that Bob um tunes in just to support me, even though he's watching WWE or something like that. Um oh, this this uh chat always perks me up. In reality, nothing. <laughs> Don't let your boss hear that, Chris. Off the top rope. Mm. <laughs> Give me names, I'm curious. Um, I know, and I called that next, right? And you said no, NXT. WWE NXT. I don't know. At least I know you're listening. Okay, everybody, welcome Millie. She's new. Um, Tuesday night is legal case night, Millie. So, um, so we are. <laughs> I don't think I'm getting all the comments because, like, wait. 
I seem to be missing some things. I don't know. Melissa Brown, did I say hello to you? Hi, sweetie. Okay, uh, this is our legal night, Tuesday. So we go over 10 legal cases. And uh, people try to guess what the outcome is going to be. And we talk about different legal principles and things. Um, and then we touch on another topic, which tonight is going to be Rose, Rose Bly. Just a, just a tad. Because there's so much um, <clears throat> misinformation in that case. Just like there is Summer Wells, Sebastian Rogers, Riley Strain. Now I see um, Ryan Upchurch has decided that uh, he's going to get involved in the Kylie Rodney case again and solve that because that wasn't Kylie Rodney. He's um, <laughs> Chris. <laughs> oh, Eve, he actually is nice. I have to say that. Um, okay. So here we go. Here's the case 41. Gambler wants his money back. This is in England. 2008, not too long ago. Calvert v. William Hill Credit. Working as a Greyhound trainer, Graham Calvert was a good judge of Greyhound ability. He gambled mostly on Greyhound races. Being somewhat successful, he became more and more addicted to gambling. <laughs> Hi, Carrie Moody. Thanks, Han. Everybody go sub up to Carrie. She does some really great stuff. Um... Anybody take that link and hop up here if you want to. Okay. Yeah, drop drop Carrie's link, please, Eve. I know you're up on it. Um, Graham, okay. She is moody. <laughs> She's not moody. Carrie's a sweetheart. Okay. <clears throat> Oh my God, I got people. <laughs> Hi, Evil Alaska. Welcome. <laughs> you said pooping all in here. <laughs> yeah, Ryan. Yes, KDN. Um, <laughs> um, yeah. He showed those two pictures of those girls. It's the same girl. With a nose job and a and hair dye and I'm like the teeth are totally different, the hair's totally different. There isn't anything about those two girls that look alike at all. And every single person in chat, except for one, who's probably his dad, said that that was not that was not the same people. <laughs> Carrie, okay, you guys, I got to get to these cases. Um, yeah, some new people in here. Okay. So, Graham is addicted to gambling. He opened an account with William Hill. <laughs> you guys are being too funny. <laughs> okay. Make me laugh. I know that. <laughs> Is he trying to gaslight people? He doesn't honestly really believe that, does he? I don't know if he had his glasses on when he was looking at that. I don't. I don't know. But yeah, to think that Riley Strain and Kylie Rodney are connected is a little far out. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, that's why I posted that. I'm like, what the? Those, um, yeah, I'm sorry. Those are two different people. Okay. 
Graham opened an account with William Hill, an agency that received and paid off bets. In eight days, he bet almost 420,000 pounds. What is that now? What is the pound going for? It used to be $2 to the pound, but I don't think it is anymore. Anyway, a lot of money. Um, he understood that he had a problem, really. In eight days, he bet half a million dollars, half a million pounds. So he asked William Hill to close his account and refused to reopen it if he asked. William Hill agreed and closed his account because it had recently adopted a policy that it would do this to protect pathological gamblers. However, William Hill did not follow through on the second part of Calvert's request. It allowed him to reopen his account 18 days later and continued to accept his bets, which became enormous and were no longer mostly on Greyhound races. One of the bets was for 347,000 pounds for the U.S. to beat the Europeans in the Riders' Cup golf tournament, which the Europeans won easily. Within seven months, he was financially ruined, having lost over 1.5 million on over 4 million in bets. Oh, Millie. Thank you. Thank you, hon. Yeah, London is an expensive little place, isn't it? Okay, Calvert sued William Hill for negligently breaching its duty to keep him from betting. He asked the court to award him the money he lost. Does Calvert win? Um, okay. What what you say, Eve? <laughs> Nobody wants to guess. One pound equals six. I love my chat. You guys are honestly the very best chat on YouTube, I swear. Yes, yes. Everybody says yes. Calvert wins. Does Calvert's decision to continue betting mean that he's responsible for his actions? Hmm. Does Calvert win? Um, did, did William Hill have a duty to keep William Hill from betting? I don't think it did. I don't think he did. <laughs> Are you saying I'm goofy as fuck, Carrie? <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Running Fox. Welcome. Yes, we are chatting and laughing. Yes, don't bet if... Yes. Absolutely. That's why when I bet on football games, I bet a dollar. <laughs> and somehow it pisses people off to have to pay me that dollar. <laughs> Oh, Annabelle, you're fine. I'll say no. Okay, we got no, 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 and two yeses. Okay, let's see. Here we go. Does he get his money back? Calvert loses. William Hill was negligent, but the negligence did not cover Calvert's losses. The court agreed that William Hill breached its duty to Calvert. But it also thought that the agency's breach of duty did not make it responsible for Calvert's losses. The court had to figure out the scope of the duty and how to quantify the value of that duty. Clearly, William Hill did not have a duty to prevent Calvert from gambling. Oh, that's true. Calvert could have gambled and lost with another agency or online. Good point. Why didn't anybody bring that up? So the court that thought that it had to consider what Calvert would have done had William Hill kept the account closed. It believed that Calvert would have continued to gamble and the result would have been the same. Um, I agree. Yep. <laughs> the 
Thank you, Carrie. That means a lot coming from you, really. I, I highly respect you and your channel. Focus, children. <laughs> okay. So the court did not believe that Calvert's decision to continue to gamble freed William Hill of responsibility. Had William Hill been Calvert's only option, it's possible that it would have been liable for his losses. I wonder if he quit gambling after he went to prison or whatever. You know, I guess that's, they say gambling is the hardest addiction to beat. Huh, I wonder if it's harder than drugs. Supposedly it's harder than alcohol. Okay. Um, case 42, Grocer's son does not clean up his mess. My cat's going to jump on me in a second. Uh, thank you, Logan. Omaha, Nebraska, 1931, Simonson v. Thorne. Theodore Thorne was driving his father's grocery delivery truck. My grandfather had a grocery store, and he had a del grocery delivery truck. Way before his time, when it hit an oil slick, slid off the road, and crashed into a trolley pole. They have trolleys in Omaha. Knocking it into the street. It was determined that he was driving carefully and not negligently. Because the pole was not his property and was not knocked over due to his negligence, Thorin th thought that he was free to leave the pole where it was and had no duty to warn other drivers, so he left the scene. Meanwhile, Mary Simonson was driving with her husband. She was injured when her husband crashed into the pole. She sued Thorin for negligently leaving the pole in the middle of the street. Does Simonson win? <laughs> okay. Thorin was driving his father's grocery delivery truck when he hit an oil slick, slid off the road, and crashed into a trolley pole. I don't know what a trolley pole is. Could he move it off the road? How was it determined that he was... I have a lot of questions here. How was it determined that he was not negligent if the cops weren't there? And if the cops were there, why didn't they have a duty to warn other drivers yeah i'm thinking fleeing the scene right he shouldn't have left the pole right fleeing the scene i would think with the hay okay uh simonson wins thorne has a duty to either remove the hazard or warn approaching drivers this was Supreme Court of Nebraska. How did they find him? Oh, that's a good question, too. I don't know. I have a lot of questions. Where, where were the cops here? Okay, even though Thorin did not negligently create the hazard, he still created it. It was foreseeable that someone would hit the pole and be injured, so a reasonable person would have either removed the pole or warned approaching cars. A bystander would not be under any obligation to remove the hazard. That's interesting. I would still try to warn people. Um, I actually did in a, a situation like that. The court compared Thorne's duty to that of workmen who dig up the street. The workmen do not negligently create the hazard, but they still have a duty to place plenty of warning signs to make sure that nobody drives into the hole. The court wrote, one cannot obstruct the street in such a manner and say, I obstructed the street, but I thought someone else would warn of the danger. <laughs> Chris does not. <laughs> hey, Chris, next, next uh, week we'll go over some bar exam questions. <laughs> See how you do. <laughs> he does not have a channel. No, he doesn't want anybody to see or hear him. 
Well, if he had no arms, he wouldn't be driving a truck, presumably, because uh, the DOT would not allow him to pass the exam. I can guarantee you that because they're pretty freaking... Um, well, why didn't he call the cops, though? I don't know. I think that I'm um, pretty sure the cops showed up once the gentleman and the lady hit the pole. I don't know. What year did this accident happen? It was. Uh, 1931, a trolley pole. I don't know. <laughs> There's a guy that drives with his feet. Oh, you know, you, yeah. Well, he could have kicked the pole out of the way then. I know that's, don't anybody accuse me of being. Yeah. Oh, right. No cell phone. Was it a car or a car? It was a truck, a delivery truck. Um, okay, here we go. <laughs> okay, case 43. Woman sues friend over bad advice. This is in London, England, 1988, which was just yesterday on my calendar. Chowdhury v prabhakar <laughs> evil <laughs> you are evil oh my goodness okay nasma chowdhury a 26 year old woman had just gotten her driver's license here we go more driving questions she asked her close friend kamal prabhakar if he would recommend a used car she had one requirement that the car not have been in an accident her friend, who worked in a grocery store, had bought and sold numerous cars himself and had even helped her cousin buy a car. He agreed to help her for free as a friend. Okay, so I think that's probably going to be important. Um, does he have a duty? He located a one-year-old used Volkswagen Golf with 8,000 miles that he liked. However, the car's hood looked like it had been crumpled and recently repaired. The seller worked as a body shop as a car sprayer and panel beater. He showed her the car. She asked if it had been in an accident. He told her that it had not been, but admitted at the trial that he had never asked the seller. He said the car was good and told her that she didn't need to take it to a mechanic. She bought the car. Several months later, she took it to a mechanic who said the car had been in a serious accident and would need its entire engine rebuilt. Upon further inquiry, it appeared that the car had been bought for salvage. She sued him for negligent advice. Does Chowdhury win? Um, consider, does the fact that he's unpaid shield him from any claim of negligence? I would say... Yes, I would say he did not have a duty to her because she's not paying him. Right? I'd say he wasn't exactly a very good friend. Um, <laughs> 1988. <laughs> oh, come on, but it still wasn't that long ago. Um, okay. So, exactly. He's not a mechanic or a car specialist. So, you're saying that she does win? She sues, She wins from her friend who recommended the car? I think so, too. Yes, you're right. He was not a mechanic. Oh, I think so, too. Yes. I believe so. I mean, he works in a grocery store, right? Although he had bought and sold numerous cars. Well, this is an interesting one. I agree, Millie. 
Oh, as a friend, yeah, I'm, I think he sucks too, though. Does the fact he's unpaid shield him from? <laughs> yeah, I don't think I'd sue my friend because they told me to buy something that was a lemon. And it's kind of odd that she drove it for months before she decided it had an engine problem. I don't know. You know what? She should have used Carfax. <laughs> <laughs> okay here we go big reveal even though annabelle and eve have not um chimed in yet Ooh, she wins oh my goodness he breached his duty to meet the standard expected of an unpaid advisor i'm shocked here when someone volunteers to help i don't recall uh i don't recall him volunteering she asked him would you call that volunteering <laughs> I know I'm terrible. <laughs> well, am I wrong, Carrie? Am I wrong? <laughs> I I don't think he volunteered. She asked him and he goes, okay. <laughs> Um, and implies that they have the experience and her skills to do the job, then they must perform the job to the standard expected. He worked in a grocery store. I'm not agreeing with the Court of Appeals here. I'm sorry. The standard was not high. All he had to do was ask if the car had been in an accident. That's true. And he did notice the crumpled hood. And he was buying it from a body shop, right? Failing that, if he had just answered her question truthfully, he would have been free from liability. Well, that's true, too. He told her no when he really didn't know. An advisor who says they will find an accident for used car and then fails to ask the seller if the car has been in an accident is being negligent. This is even truer if the advisor lies when asked directly ignores the warning sign of a crumpled hood and says the car doesn't need to be inspected oh yeah he did tell her that didn't he he did tell her she didn't need to take it to a mechanic and now i'm thinking maybe he's a little shady although he didn't make any money out of it <laughs> in this case chowdhury also won against the seller who implied that the car was good for ordinary use. Had the seller said the car was being sold as is, he too would probably have been free from liability. So she sued the seller and her friend? Holy crap. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Exactly. Oh, wait. What did he <laughs> You guys are hilarious. <laughs> this is... Chris, this is the appeals court's decision. <laughs> I guess you could take it to the Supreme Court. <laughs> Doubt they'd agree to hear it, though. <laughs> oh, I always wanted to be a lawyer. Ever since I was little, tiny. Um, that's why I got my paralegal degree, because I thought it would be good training for law school. But yeah, that whole thing kind of fell apart. I know. <laughs> Did she win back double the, and she got to keep the car? Wow. <laughs> what the deal? Oh. <laughs> You're going to give me 
and asthma attack. <laughs> 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 you guys are hilarious. Taylor's sister. <laughs> People that think that these legal cases are going to be boring are missing a lot. This is almost as funny as those first ones, Jenna. John and whatever. Jack and Jill. <laughs> oh, <gee. laughs> Can you... <laughs> I doubt it. Uh, it. No, being the paralegal worked out. It was the... Um, what? No, it was the engagement. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It was the engagement and move and law school that didn't work out. I don't think I can sue for that. <laughs> Especially since I was the one that broke up. Um. <laughs> oh, I'll Drink a minute. <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> It's always because like <laughs> I got some smart, sassy, witty people over here that are right on the ball. <laughs> Thanks, Gary. I don't either. People don't like me. <laughs> people don't like to hear the truth. I think um, I don't buy into crap. Okay, here we go. <laughs> I'm thinking this is going to be kind of a funny one just by the, yes, breathe. Okay. <laughs> if only I was the one that had the fucking genius idea to search back over <laughs> the world and get 1200 too. <laughs> You guys are mean because you know that I have trouble breathing anyway. Oh, my God. Okay. Just start cussing like a sailor. I know I did. I said fuck twice tonight. <laughs> I never do that. Okay. That's my truck driver talk coming out. Um. Yeah, I couldn't. I don't know how she fits all that in there. But then I'd have to delete my life. <laughs> I'm going to lose my channel. I don't want to be a dirty deleter. Okay, here we go. Uh, drunk snow tuber in shirt and race. <laughs> 
Thunder Bay, Ontario, 1988. Crocker v. Sundance Northwest Resorts Limited. <laughs> I know, and people tell her how awesome she is. <laughs> ideal, Annabelle, not idea, ideal. <laughs> oh, Carrie. <laughs> I don't even know why I was in there last. Oh, I was because she's put Andy. Um, she was mad at Ryan. Oh my gal, she went off on Ryan. She told everybody she was going to let loose that she is just the nicest person on earth. She never says anything bad about anyone, and she just lets everything roll off her back. Never responds to anyone, but she, that was all Andy <laughs> last night. That people better get ready because she was going to go off, probably on a lot of people. And she started with Ryan. She was mad because it was her. <laughs> it was. <laughs> no, no, you can't go back later. It was her. Um. Her genius fucking idea to search Ben Hill Road. And so Ryan went there and then he fumbled the balls. <laughs> People were laughing about that. <laughs> Ryan fumbling the balls. And, um, but her headline was that Andy and his parents wouldn't let Ryan search the property anymore. She said, I guess I found something. So she indicated that he found that he found something there because PG let him there. But then he dropped the ball because there was a box there that he didn't look in the box. So he ruined it. And this is all because Ryan said that PG, because she was laughing and making fun of the house. I'm not looking at chat right now, so I can think. Because people were making so much fun of the house and how trashed it was and everything. And um, that Andy and his parents got upset and wouldn't let them back on the property. So PG's all pissed off because Ryan blamed her. <laughs> this is why I stay out of all that. I don't hook up with anybody. I'm just out here on my own. Um, <laughs> she did. She, she had Sherry, Lisa Jutton, and Pam Tate up there. And Lisa Jutton, or Pam Tate said, oh, it's my birthday tomorrow. Everybody's son, um, Pepsi and Bologna. And PG says, that's it. I, I don't have time for this bullshit. And she can't do it. <laughs> she, was, she was in a tear. <laughs> And Sherry needs to come in here. <laughs> I know, because people started slamming on Sherry then. Somebody, I'm not sure. <laughs> oh my goodness. Jody's <laughs> She's got me blocked. I don't think. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Um, yes, yeah, she's strange. Okay, back, yes, back to our, um, purpose here. Um, real balls? I'm not sure. I think she meant he dropped the ball. She handed him the ball and he dropped it. He was supposed to look in the box because she said that Summer's bones or clothes could have been in the box that was on a shelf in the house. Whatever. <laughs> just, just hate watching. Okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> no frivolity in my chat. 
Okay, William Cracker, age 29, and a friend were visiting a ski resort on the north shore of Lake Superior. For profit in the entertainment of its guests, Sundance Northwest Resorts held a two-heat tubing race down a steep hill with large bumps called moguls. For a $200 prize, this is in 1988, that's pretty good, Teams of two rode a single oversized inner tube down the slopes using their feet to steer and brake in the snow. What? <laughs> I don't think you'd be sliding down a steep hill using my feet to steer and brake. The event was dangerous. Tubers frequently wiped out as they rode their clumsy tubes over the moguls. Cracker and his friend paid a fee and signed an entry form that included a waiver of liability that Crocker did not read or even see. <clears throat> Yet he signed it, right? I, I read everything. Before their first heat, the friends wearing the competition bibs drank large quantities of their own alcohol and bought more from the resort's bar. In the first heat, they wiped out and Crocker cut himself above his eye. Between races, Crocker had two more drinks. <laughs> Why the hell not? <laughs> Drunken bleeding and became completely intoxicated. Crack cracker. <laughs> um, the resort owner and manager separately saw how drunk Crocker was and told him that he should not continue, but Crocker insisted. Just before his final race, Cracker fell down and lost his tube down the mountain. Race officials gave him another. In the final race, Cracker was thrown from the tube and seriously injured. He sued Sundance for not stopping him from participating in the event. Does Cracker win? Okay, I have a question. What is his buddy? Where was his buddy? He fell down and lost his tube. It's a two-man tube. All right. <clears throat> I know, Squirrely Girl. <laughs> you guys, I'm going to give you a test. <laughs> Chris, are you? This isn't the dating game here in my chat. <laughs> it's not Tinder here. Okay. Um. <laughs> you, you need to get timed out from me, Carrie. <laughs> I don't time anyone out. Luckily, I don't have to. Okay, is there a special relationship between Cracker and Sundance? Whose responsibility is it to keep Cracker off the slopes? Crocker's or Sundance's or both? Okay, he's 29. He paid. Okay, he signed a waiver of liability. Um. He signed a waiver of liability. And he drank. And he drank some more. And then he drank some more. I wonder why his friend didn't stop in. Step in. Okay, the resort owner told him he should not continue. Yeah, I don't know if they should have given him another tube. What do you think? I don't know. <laughs> I don't have an accent. I don't have <laughs> No, you did not, Carrie. <laughs> What's going on? Crocker. C-R-O-C-K-E-R. I don't have an accent. Crocker. Okay, like Betty Crocker. There you go. 
Well, Millie's okay. Millie says no. Does Cracker win? Millie says no. Eve says yes. Chris says yes. <laughs> okay, here we go. Split decision. This went to the Supreme Court of Canada. There was a special relationship. Sundance owed a duty to stop Cracker from participating. In a unanimous 6-2-0 decision, the Supreme Court of Canada said that Crocker was at fault for drinking heavily before participating in a risky activity and that Sundance was at fault for breaching its duty to stop Cracker. <laughs> I'm sorry, I had to. <laughs> As event organizers, the resort had a duty to make sure the event was safe and the resort's actions established a special relationship with Crocker. It served him alcohol, even though it knew he was in the race. Oh, because he had the bib on. The owner and manager separately talked with him, noticed he was drunk, and foresaw the danger. Because Sundance had a duty, it should have kept him from racing, denying him another inner tube, disqualifying him for drunkenness, or calling the police if he refused to comply were all options. Um... The court accepted Crocker's claim that he thought he had filled out an entry form and not a waiver. No, I don't think that's not right. The judges noted that Sundance staff did not remind Crocker or tell him that he had signed a legal waiver of liability. I wonder how much, I wonder what he sued him for. So he got 75% of what he sued. Interesting. Okay. <laughs> Chris. <laughs> you do. Oh my god, we're doing the dating game here. Okay. All right, I'm all caught up. Hey, um, Eve, you got that one right. Okay, this one should be good. Uh, overlooked bull tosses farm hand about like a rag doll. Uh, Lenoir County, North Carolina. Anybody from North Carolina? Um. 1941, Hill v. Mosley. 13-year-old Coy Hill was working on Mosley's farm. Mosley's milkman asked Hill to move the cows from their pen to the pasture. Hill did not know that there was a mean Guernsey bull mixed in with the cows. The bull charged Hill, struck him in the back, tossed him up in the air, caught him on his head, threw him on the ground, and rolled him 25 to 30 yards before help arrived. One of the prior tenants of the farm confirmed the bull's foul temper. He had been chased from the bull's pen and fended off the bull with a pitchfork. Another time, the bull tore out the house steps and garden posts and was in the middle of wrecking the chimney when a tenant shot the bull with a shotgun. Number six, bird shot, whatever that does. It did not injure the bull, but it did get him to stop wrecking the house. Hill sued Mosley for failing to warn him of and protect him from the vicious bull. Does Hill win? Um. <laughs> hey, Chris. You were worried about being able to afford a lawyer. <laughs> you can go pro se now. Um, Hill does win, you guys think? Does it matter that it was not Mosley who sent Hill into the pen with the bull? Mosley's milkman. So, I would say Hill does win because...
uh, his milkman was his employee, right? So the buck stopped there. No, you don't need to hear it again, Chris. <laughs> Just say yes or no. <laughs> okay. What do we got? Annabelle says yes, he'll win. Eve says no. Chris has no idea. Squirrely Girl says no. Um, this is true. In a criminal case, in a, a civil case, I. Well, it depends on how prepared you are. Okay, does Hill win? Hill wins. If you keep a vicious animal, you're liable for the injuries it causes. This was also a Supreme Court case, Supreme Court of North Carolina. The case was clear cut, mostly owned an animal that he either knew or should have known was vicious. Mostly should not have permitted Hill to enter the enclosure without proper training and warning. It was not important that the milkman had sent the young boy into the pen. The milkman was acting as Mosley's agent. So it's as if Mosley has sent the boy in himself. Well, I agree with that. It's like if you have, you know, tell somebody to use the forklift, like they have to be trained and certified, right? <laughs> <laughs> I defer from that you accuse you accuse yourself Chris come on get the lingo down right <laughs> anyone can be a doctor on YouTube too you see people on Facebook act asking advice about and showing pictures of injuries. <laughs> Asking people what they think they should do. <laughs> they can go see a doctor. <laughs> oh, and speaking of doctors, here we go. Case 46. Doctor does not warn patient's wife of tick clusters. This is going to be interesting. Oh, Memphis, Tennessee. 1993, another one that was just yesterday, Bradshaw v. Daniel. That's always the milkman. <laughs> Kay Dan, you kill me. I'm so glad that you show up for these. Okay, Elmer Johns had headaches, chills, and a fever. COVID. It's COVID. He went to the hospital where Dr. Chalmer Daniel diagnosed him with Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, a disease caused by tick. Annabelle. <laughs> Tick. <laughs> Tick. Rocky Mountain spotted fever, a disease caused by a tick bite. Oh, my God. Despite getting medicine, Johnson died the next day. However, the diagnosis was not certain, so samples were sent to the Center for Disease Control and Prevention. Daniel spoke with John's wife, Genevieve, but did not discuss his disease or its dangers. A week after her husband's death, she went to the hospital with the same symptoms and died three days later. Oh, my God. The CDC later confirmed that both deaths were caused by Rocky Mountain spotted fever. The family survivors, Bradshaw, Sued Daniel, and the case went to the Supreme Court of Tennessee. The court had to decide if Daniel had a duty to warn Genevieve Johns that the ticks that cause Rocky Mountain spotted fever tend to cluster in particular areas and that she should be on the lookout for any similar symptoms. At the trial, Daniel said that he knew that family members were at risk because of clustering, but he said that she was not his patient and that Rocky Mountain spotted fever is not a contagious disease, so there was no duty to warn. Does Daniel have a duty to warn family members about tick clusters? Um, wow. 
No. Um. Oh my God. <laughs> Millie, it says so she was not his patient. She was not his patient, and Rocky Mountain spotted fever is not contagious. But he knew they were at risk. He's a doctor. Should a doctor. Wow. Annabelle says yes. Oh, man. He's got a, a moral duty, an ethical duty, if not a legal duty. He's right. She was not his patient because she didn't have Rocky Mountain spotted fever yet, right? Um, he knew the family members were at risk. <sighs> Right, Chris, you're pretty good at these. Maybe you should think about law school. Um, wow. Oh, wow. I'm going to say... I'm going to say yes, he does have a duty. I know, I think so too. Yes! Yes, we're right. <clears throat> All right, Squirrely Girl, Eve, Melissa, yes, Brecha wins. This this is did go to the Supreme Court. Daniel has a duty to warn. This was not a medical malpractice case, so whether Mrs. Johns was Daniel's patient was not relevant. Okay, that's a good point. The question was whether a doctor has a duty to warn a family member who was at risk for Rocky Mountain spotted fever. In cases where patients had contagious diseases, doctors already had a duty to warn family members about the risks. Because of the clustering, the court thought that Rocky Mountain spotted fever fell into that category. It's worth noting that at that time, the death rate for Rocky Mountain spotted fever was around 5% but it was 20 to 25% for undi undiagnosed cases. So getting treatment quickly was very important. While the court ruled that there was a duty, it did not decide on the issue of negligence. Instead, it sent the case back down to the lower court for trial. Well, Chris, not exactly. They just sent the case back down. Somebody um, shepherdize that case for me, will ya? <laughs> I might have to check that out and see. Um, I'll see what I can find out and post an update. Must be the lower court dismissed it and Bradshaw took it on to the Supreme Court. Well, that's an interesting case. <laughs> I don't know. That's what I just said. I don't know. I'll look, okay? I'm going to check that out for you, Chris, and I'll let you know. Okay. Um, oh, my goodness. There's an English one. Why does it have an arrow in it? Officer told to drive against traffic gets injured. Birmingham, England, 1981, Knightley v. Johns, and others. As twilight spread its shadow over the industrial city of Birmingham, this sounds like that Snoopy, it was a dark and stormy night. <laughs> I'm getting those uh, Charlie Brown vibes. As twilight spreads its shadow over the industrial city of Birmingham, I like that. Thomas Johns was driving negligently through a tunnel. He crashed and flipped his car. It's pretty hard to flip your car in a tunnel, isn't it? The first to the scene was Police Inspector Somerville. Soon after, two constables arrived on motorcycles. The inspector, against department regulations for accidents in tunnels, 
failed to close the tunnel when he got there. So he told the constables to ride against traffic, also against regulations, to barricade the tunnel's entrance. He should have told them to drive the long way around to get to the tunnel's entrance, but he wanted the tunnel closed fast. As the constables drove up the tunnel, they turned on their flashing blue lights and two-tone horns. They each hugged a tunnel wall. Why didn't they drive down the lane that was blocked? Jeffrey, Jeffrey Cotton was driving in the tunnel at a safe speed when he rounded a blind curve and saw the flashing lights. He braked and swerved. He avoided one constable, but hit and injured the other. Constable Leonard Knightley. Knightley sued Johns, Cottons, and the inspector for his injuries. Holy crap. Johns, Cottons, and the inspector. Okay. Yeah, hold your beer. Oh, international. <laughs> I think I'm going to have to hold everybody's beer on this one. Does Knightley win against Johns, the driver who originally flipped his car? No. I'm saying no. I'm saying no to that. Does he win against Cotton, the driver who hit him in the tunnel? Um, I'm saying no to that one, too. Okay, does he win against the inspector? Yes, I would say yes, because it was his duty to close the tunnel. And he also um, told the constables to ride against traffic, right? So who sued who? Nightly sued everybody. The guy that got hit sued the guy who flipped the car. The guy who hit him and his boss. Does the inspector's negligent rescue break the connection between John's crash and Knightley's injury? Cops are at fault. I think so, too. No, yes, I agree, Chris. Oh, everybody agrees with Chris. What the hell? <laughs> Everybody's going to be asking for your advice, Chris. Okay. Haha. -ha. You're right, and I'm right, too. Court of Appeals. Knightley loses to Johns and Cottons. Knightley wins against the inspector. The inspector breached his duty because the inspector's negligence was not foreseeable. Johns was not liable. In the first trial, the court thought that John's driving was the root and only cause of all the confusion and the accident that injured Knightley. On appeal, however, the higher court reversed the lower court's decision. John's was not responsible because the inspector's negligence was not foreseeable. The judge wrote, too much happened here, that's for sure. The chapter of mistakes was too long and varied to impose liability on Mr. John's. It was natural, it was foreseeable, it was indeed certain that the police would come and control the tunnel traffic. The reasonable observer would anticipate some human error, some forms of folly in the course of their rescuer's duties. But would he anticipate so many errors? The court said the inspector was responsible for Knightley's injuries because he breached his duty to follow department rules. The department had foreseen the danger of not closing the tunnel and driving against the flow of traffic. Therefore, the inspector, not Johns, was liable. Cotton was not liable because he was driving at a safe speed on a seemingly open road. Yes, no longer, no longer drunk and dumb. <laughs> oh my god! Okay, here we go. We got three more cases. 
Um, oh my God. <laughs> Termites defeat humans when privy collapses. Everybody knows what a privy is, right? Outhouse? An outhouse. <laughs> Dr. Lawyer Marshall. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I didn't know Millie was. I didn't know Millie was gone. Did I miss that? <laughs> okay. Um. Okay. Essex, Essex County, New Jersey. Anybody know anything about anybody living in New Jersey? <laughs> I'm just, I'm just trying to start shit. Okay. 1929, Rush v. Commercial Realty Company. Oh, this should be interesting. Back in the 1920s, there was very little indoor plumbing and wooden outhouses were common. I don't know why as kids we thought using that outhouse was so much fun. <laughs> Sunk the high heaven. <laughs> sitting, sitting on that wood. Yeah, that was a lot of fun. Um, <laughs> I'm just making fun of this. <laughs> I can't take it here. I can't take it here. Okay, <coughs> you guys. Okay, wooden outhouses were common, primarily homes for spiders and termites. I didn't know that. Outhouses were also used as bathrooms. <laughs> I get that now. Primarily homes for spiders and termites. They were also used as bathrooms. And included a seat over a deep hole. Ours didn't have a seat. <laughs> a hole. Um, a Sears catalog for toilet paper and a bucket of lime. And the, to keep the smell at bay, the lime didn't work all that well. Mary Rush, who rented from Commercial Realty Company, needed to use her outhouse. When she entered, she saw that the wood was rotting and unstable. She realized that it might not be safe, but she needed to go badly, so she went. And the floor beneath her collapsed. She, oh my God. She fell nine feet into the mess below. I've never known of an outhouse that was nine feet deep. <laughs> what? A cat attacked you? <laughs> oh, <I'm really. laughs> okay. She was rescued, then she sued for the negligently maintained outhouse. Does Rush win? Oh my God, did Rush voluntarily assume the risk that the floor might collapse? There's little termites crawling across this card. <laughs> Chris is so funny. <laughs> okay. Commercial Realty Company. Let's see. Primarily at home. Okay. Mary Rush, who rented from Commercial Realty. Okay. So this is a house. And she was renting a house. And she needed to use the outhouse. She saw that the wood was rotting. Did she just move in? Like, this is the very first time she's ever noticed that the wood was rotting. Um. She sued for the negligently maintained outhouse. I say yes, she wins. Chris, you might die out. <laughs> Hi, Misha. Oh my God. 
<laughs> that was good. I'm I don't watch a lot of stuff, but I, I watched that the series or whatever. But I'm glad you showed out, Misha. Thank you. Um <laughs> We have left our ass off. <laughs> she wins, she wins, she wins. Okay, everybody thinks she wins. I think she wins too. If she's running the house. Yes, Rush wins. Yay, everybody was right. Rush did not voluntarily assume the risk because she had to go and could not wait. That's a good point. The landlord said that Rush voluntarily assumed the risk of the floor collapsing. However, the court said Mrs. Rush had no choice when impelled by the calls of nature, but to use the facilities placed at her disposal by the landlord. In other words, she did not voluntarily assume risk because she had no choice but to assume the risk. The court said that because commercial realty had a duty to maintain the outhouse, they couldn't blame the tenants. Um, I got to sneeze just a minute. Okay, I'm back. Imagine the entrance to an apartment building that all tenants must walk through to get to their apartments. The building owner cannot maintain it and then claim that a tenant assumed the risk of injury when they walked through and a piece of ceiling fell on their head. Oh. Eve, did you time everybody out? <laughs> For how long? <laughs> Okay, I don't think this this one is not going to, oh my God, this one is not going to be funny. Holy mackerel. Motorcyclist leaves trail of blood, debris, and trauma. I'm sorry, motorcycles are so dangerous. My dad's friend almost died when one from an accident. I burned my leg and the exhaust a couple of times okay edinburgh scotland 1942 borhill v young john young was riding his motorcycle at excessive speed when a car turned in front of him he hit the car was thrown from his bike and died instantly at the time mrs borhill a fishwife was 50 feet away and was just getting off the tram she was shouldering her basket of fish, and the driver was assisting to get the basket onto her back and the broad leather strap onto her forehead when she heard but did not see the crash. She was never in danger and did not fear injury. After Young's body had been removed, Borhill walked by the site of the accident. At the sight of the wreckage and blood, Mrs. Borhill violently recoiled and injured her back. She was also shocked, sickened, and made anxious. She was eight months pregnant but lost the baby after witnessing the scene. She claimed that the loss of her baby was due to her emotional distress caused by Young's negligent driving. Borhill sued Young's estate. She sued the motorcycle driver who died. Um, Uh-oh. Yeah, we're not laughing now. What are the public policy implications of siding with Borhill? Um... I don't think she, I don't think she wins. I'm going to say no. Yes, he was driving at excessive speed when a car turned in front of him. Um, 
Um, nobody's nobody's going to chime. I don't know what this one, Chris. I'm, yeah, Chris, you and Chris in the corner. Oh my goodness, Chris. All right, we're going to go ahead with this. Boreal loses. <clears throat> I agree. I agree with that. Young had no duty to protect unthreatened bystanders. The court wrote the duty of a driver is to use proper care not to injure persons on the highway or adjoining the highway. Proper care means not speeding, keeping a good lookout, observing traffic rules and signals, and so on. Then to whom is the duty owed? To persons who could reasonably expect to be injured by the failure to take proper care. Therefore, Young was ne negligent towards the owner of the car he hit, but not towards Borhill. In short, the courts did not want every witness to an accident or its aftermath to be filing claims for emotional distress. I agree with that. No, I wasn't. I wasn't sure either, Eve. Annabelle, are you still here, or are you off doing something else? <laughs> I'm going to call you out. I clearly. <laughs> okay, case fifty. This is our last one. Who takes the fall in a barroom brawl? Okay. Chris. <laughs> All right, Annabelle. <laughs> um, Multnomah County, Oregon. I'm not even going to try to pronounce this. 1971. Stashnowitz v. Markham Corp. John Stashnowitz and his friends were drinking at a bar owned by Markham Corp. When a friend of Stashnowitz refused to allow an intoxicated man from another group to dance with his wife. Insults were hurled at Statsnowitz's group. They complained to the bartender who told them not to cause trouble with the drunk patrons. <laughs> Millie. <laughs> Insults turned into shoves, which then exploded into a barroom brawl. Oh, awesome. During the brawl, someone shouted, Fuzz. And a number of men, including Stashnowitz, ran outside. Soon after, Stashnowitz was found unconscious. He could not remember what happened. Stashnowitz sued the bar for his injuries. At the time, the Oregon Liquor Commission had passed a regulation that said no bar shall permit any loud, noisy, disorderly, or boisterous conduct or any profane or abusive language. I wonder if that's still in effect. The bar argued that he was injured outside the bar and there was no way to know who actually injured Stashnowitz. Does Stashnowitz win? Yes, Eve, we do love all the people in the bushes, like Bob. Bob's in the bushes. Um, <laughs> that's what happens in the bar. <laughs> Did Stashnowitz assume the risk of injury when he became part of a barroom brawl? Okay, they were drinking. Um, a man tried to dance with the wife of one of his friends. They complained to the bartender who told them not to cause trouble with drunk patrons. Okay, insults turned into shoves. So they're just running because they think the police are there. He was found unconscious. He could not remember. Um, boy, that's a good question. Really? Millie, you led an interesting life, didn't you? Bob came out of the bushes. He did? No, he didn't. <laughs> He'll probably text me when it's done. 
I'd fight freedom of speech. I know. <laughs> Bob just comes and goes. Bob's Bob Bob's in and out of chat. Um <clears throat> Okay, what what say everybody? Wow. Stashnowitz wins. This went to the Supreme Court of Oregon. The bar breached its duty to follow the law, which was passed to stop bar fights. Well, the court took it as a given that Stashnowitz was hurt in a bar fight. It was not important that Stashnowitz was, I wish he had an easier to pronounce name. I mean, it's late. It was just outside the door. The court said that the regulation prohibiting Disorderly conduct was passed with this situation in mind. Allowing insult shouting drunks to stay in your bar creates a hazard that could result in a fight and injury. Stashnowitz and his group, who did not start the brawl but tried to prevent it, were the type of people the law was designed to protect. Stashnowitz's injuries were foreseeable and were, in fact, foreseen by the commission. The court added that the risk was obvious given the West's long history of saloon brawls recounted in many Hollywood Westerns. Seriously? It's 1971. <laughs> <gasps> Squirrely girl. are going crazy. <laughs> Chris has got all the girls after him here. Okay. That went kind of long. So should we do the um <laughs> um Bob's watch from wrestling. Okay, so should we um do the Rose Bly thing? Annabelle, what do you think? Or should we wait till next time? I'm kind of um squirrely. <laughs> Squirrel girl. <laughs> Melissa Brown, yes, we should do it. Okay, so PG will be mad if you don't invite her. <laughs> All right, Melissa Brown wants to do it. Let me see. Okay. I don't think I'm going to do the whole thing I was going to do here. But, uh. Okay, here is um, Brett Walk. Okay, I'm going to play this. This is part of the interview that they did um, at the 10th anniversary of Rose's disappearance. I need to see what Peachy looks like. <laughs> You're not going to be right back, Millie. 715-485-8383. We're in 10 years. Um, our community, at the Sheriff's Office, our goal here is to take a new investigative approach to this cold case. We've produced a video. We're going to show that video in a little bit. We're going to provide you a copy of the video as well. Our hope is that we can stimulate some talk in the social media avenues, as well as just get our message out to the community that we are still looking for answers to the mystery of the disappearance of Rose Bly. Um, her mother, we've produced of the disappearance of Rose Bly. Um, her mother has not seen her in 10 years. Um, our community wants these questions answered. Since 2009, we've handled over 200 tips on this case and we've interviewed over 150 people. We're hoping that by releasing this video that we can gain some more information that somebody out there knows something and they can come forward. 
and help us bring this mystery to a close. Chad, would you like to show the video? Okay, let's stop it right there for a sec, Dill. Okay, a couple of things. First of all, this video uh, was made in, first of all, this video. Uh, okay, this is, um. oh my God, you guys. Okay, this is uh, Brent Walk, um, Sheriff of Polk County. Um, and this was a video that the Sheriff's Department did on the 10th anniversary of Rose's case. I'm trying to stir interest. Let's try to save your hearing. Um, so this is being played on Chris McDonough's channel, The Interview Room. So this is the part that I thought was interesting. Let's see. Okay. Okay, that was at the conclusion of the video, and now he's going to get into the pressure. Okay, the video ended. We have the age-enhanced photo, and we've had one blown up here. Um, if Rose is out there, obviously, um, we believe she could look like that. So we felt that was important to this case. We also have the tip line, 715-485-8300. Uh, and if anybody out there knows anything about Rose Bly, please come forward. Um, our hope is that Rose Bly could come home and knock on the door and say, Mom, I'm home. But uh, we, we really am asking for help for some information. So I, I thank all of you for coming today. Um, we've given you the copy of that video. Share it. You have our right, our permission to share the video, to take whatever you need from that. Does anybody have any questions they would like to ask? Okay, so listen to this question. And he doesn't answer it either. The confusion, I guess, on the, the plan that she was going to Cushing to meet with a cousin, I understand. I, mean, I guess that's kind of always been a little unclear as to what happened that night when she didn't show up. Was there? Was it just like I stood up, you know, or did she just kind of pull it off? Or, uh, I mean, that was that's kind of confusing as to how that's what we're really hoping to to gather. Where will this be shared to get exposure? Well, we are going to be boosting it on our sheriff's office uh, Facebook, so Polk County Sheriff's Department Facebook. Um, we will have that on there, and you know, if we can get some media coverage of this story, we would greatly appreciate that. Uh, we'll also have it on the Polk County Sheriff's Department's website. Okay, so he didn't really answer that. He asked peep someone someone out there knows where she went. Someone knows what happened to her. Uh, they've been told that. They've been told what happened to her. They've been told where she went. So I'm not sure what the purpose of the video was. Okay, so I'm going to go over some things that he said. Yeah, I know. Yes, um, Chris. I know. I don't like his voice either. Trust me. Uh, yeah, he's... There's going to be a lot more to come about him on my channel. All right, I'm waiting for my... Okay. Um, let me go back to the beginning here because I took some screenshots. I cannot play that because he's got all those big warnings and copyrights and I know he'll come after me and I'll be gone. So I don't really want that. Absolutely. Absolutely. I agree with you. Okay, Dan. Um, tunnel vision in the extreme from every case and i've got i've got some something big in the works so a lot of people aren't gonna like oh bob oh my goodness 
What is going on? Does do you think boy now we're um an uh, earthquake? Do you I wonder if that has anything to do with the like the solar clips? I don't know much about science or anything like that, but I mean, does the phases of the moon affect the tides? Do they affect the te te tectonic plates too or whatever? I don't know. That's... Um... Oh, no, I love New York City, Millie. Why is my phone making noise? Yeah, I know he'll come after me. I've been warned. Um, I want my phone to shut off. For crying out loud. Okay, there we go. Yes, Millie. She was his wife. Oh, that's horrible. Thanks, Eve. You're you're so sweet. I love all my peeps in here. Yeah, that's pretty sad, Bob. Um Yeah, so my take on Chris McDonough, I don't think there's any um out where I stand and I've lost friends because of it too um there's no agree to disagree with him is that either love him or you hate him and if you don't agree with them you get blocked and your comment deleted his comments on his channel get deleted faster than people can post um Yeah, Chris is, um, he gets tunnel vision like he did with Michael Crow. He sets his sights on a, on a suspect at the beginning of a case, and then he searches for things to prove that. Instead of looking at the evidence, and then letting that lead you to a suspect um you know immediately he thinks don you know don is the one that did something to summer he even admitted that a lot of the stuff he was doing was to try to make don panic or make it explode and do something to prove chris right i know they don't like that that kind of bothers me. But you know, there's people like Kerry Moody and, um, you know, some others that also deal in facts. Um, so I love Kerry. I think I've only disagreed with her once. <laughs> Yeah, I know. I uh, oh, ouch! That wasn't very nice. I um, I do. I believe. Yes, I believe Chris's story. Not j I've never in. <laughs> All the years I've talked to him, and I have an excellent memory. Um, I don't remember anything anybody's ever said to me. I've never caught him tripped up in anything he's ever said. 
and everything he said chucked out a lot of it's backed up by evidence you know evidence that most people don't know about but um it's there do i have an orange tabby no i have tuxedo i have three tuxedo cats one that just had all his teeth pulled with the four thousand dollar vat bill which i had to borrow from my dad okay so back to this um Here he says, at that time, okay, she, Rose is the sister of Candace. Those who are not familiar, this is the sister of Candace Wells Bly. And Candace, as you know, is the mom to five year old Summer. This is Chris talking, Chris McDonough. So at the time, you know, Summer's been missing close to six months that her sister goes missing under some suspicious circumstances. So he wants to compare these cases, except that he comes down here and does not know a single thing about Rose's case. Now, if you were going to do a show alive, wouldn't you do some research beforehand, especially someone like him? Um, you know, who has a large following? I think he had seven seventy two hundred people in there that this night at one point because he pointed that out. Um, you know, he's super cop, right? In his own mind, anyway. So, he he doesn't know the first thing about this case, literally. And we were going nuts, and of course couldn't comment because he said it at subscriber for three hours or less. So, even though you subscribed, it was over with before. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I'm I might share some of scientific skeptic. He he did things on all that. That was um a nomadic truck. Yeah, he said that that was Brian Landry. Well, Henny also accused Jamie Wilson, Jack Jamie Jack Emmer Wilson, who lives in Tennessee, of when he accused him of being somebody else. And Jamie actually got death threats. And I know he was going to sue Chris. Um, I thought Nomadic Truck was going to sue him. And um, K, is it K-Rock? Uh, K-Rocks. Um, that was with the Susan Morphew case. He went after him, too. And kind of tried to claim that he was behind that or something. I mean, he just does that. Yes. Oh, yes. Oh, I have more information that's not even out there, K. Dan, about other cases and about his um, witchcraft with the whatever it is he does. <laughs> Statement analysis. You know, and he had Dr. Picado on there. I'm going to get a lot of a lot of feedback because of this. I know. Um, he had Dr. Picado on there, who seemed like a very intelligent and thoughtful person, but yet Chris was distorting the facts and giving Dr. Picado his biased version of what happened for him to analyze. Well, that's not going to help. Dr. Picado was answering questions and trying to get to the, I think he knows, he knew Chris and he knew what he was doing and he tried to get him to you know come out with it and chris is sidestepping it of course because you know he has to control it yes oh i do remember yeah i remember all that polk county did he tried to he tried to get involved in rose's case he whipped he whipped his uh, followers up and they're like oh yeah the cold case foundation is working on rose's case no they told him sorry they would not release any information on an open case because they know what he's like. Um, he tried to get involved in, oh yeah, he went out to Idaho too. I think he would have liked to have gotten involved in Coburger's case, but yeah, that didn't go anywhere for him either. Uh, 
Um, Millie, I wish. Oh, YouTube creators tormented the parents. Um, do you remember the name, Millie, or comment on here, and I'll look into that. Comment on uh, this after we're done with the live, and I'll look into it. I think I know what you're talking about. Was that the one where they went to tear it down? And uh, his clothes were at the bottom folded. I think I know what you're talking about. I know it is. Yeah, I'm glad we don't have any trolls in here after me. Okay, so here he... Um, Talked about how Rose had. I'm sorry, I'm not. I'm not that prepared. I guess I got the cat in my way. Okay, everybody's talking about the. Oh yeah, yeah. Chris, Chris was ready for the Grifter crew. That was uh, Buller and Betty, Molly Golightly, and uh, JLR were headed up there. JLR um, texted Chris and I both. Um, yeah, he. That's all they needed was uh, bullhorns up there. You know, they they don't work like that in Wisconsin. <laughs> Might work like that in Georgia or wherever else they're going around, but. Okay, so we have a private life, a public life, and a secret life. I do agree with that. Rose did have a secret life. Um, so he wants to see if there's a correlation between Summer and Rose. She's a devoted mom. She's married to a gentleman. Yes. Okay, Millie, just I'm going to take a screenshot of this. I remember that. Okay. Um, I'll look into that and we can talk about that next Tuesday night. Okay. She's married to a gentleman. We all know who he is. CL. I'll use those initials. <laughs> hey, CL. I know. Millie's been awesome in here. She fits right in. Um, they have been married for about six months. Yet they have a couple of kids, so I don't know the circumstances of that. Really? They were living in a house in St. Croix. Oh, uh, if somebody knows, throw it into chat so I can get educated on what you may know. You know, that's a really good way to, to um, figure out the facts of a case isn't it is to like let your chat tell you what's going on oh my god oh i'm so happy you joined us millie thank you okay they were living in the house in saint Croix falls now where are we oh and then he starts talking about oh he knows where uh, St. Croix Falls is because there was another case he was involved in. Yeah, I know about his involvement in that case too. And we're going to talk about that at some point. Like, let's blow your own horn because he, um, yeah, a case he worked on that was solved before he started to work on it. Oh, he got a confession out of him. Okay, Chris. Yeah, whatever. So, she was living there with her husband, C.L., and allegedly, she decides to leave the house after dinner with her father-in-law and her husband. Um, her father-in-law was out of the state and had been all week. She did not have dinner with her father-in-law. Um, so, the first question, you know, that strikes me is the father-in-law seems to be an enigma here. Well, because he's not involved and he wasn't around. That's probably why. Um, I correlate that 
to almost Summer's grandmother. I have been not been able to find out too much information about CL's dad. Really, Chris, how hard did you look? Where did you look? Who did you ask? Maybe chat could fill you in. Oh, so now he's saying correlated coincidences because Chris's dad in this in in his in Rose's case is similar to um Candy in Summer's case that he doesn't know much about either one of them. So this is one of his red flags. <laughs> Well, they did have a meeting, um, Chris. Remember the day after 4th of July? But that was like not last year, was it? That was the year before, I think. Yeah, they don't. Uh, I don't know. They want me to shut up. They told him that. <laughs> um. Okay, so she leaves the house and the public messaging, public messaging, what is that? Is that she's going to meet the cousin for drinks and there has been, you know, different places that have been bannered about in relationship to where she was heading. And one thing the sheriff's department has said that they found her vehicle and there's been speculation that from one sheriff's department reported, and it's a media report as well, that it was found where truckers hang out. No, it was not found where truckers hang out. I mean, he just... Um, It's a little tiny parking lot. It's a municipal post office parking lot. It's not a truck stop. Truckers did not hang out there. Just, I don't know how to go through this. It just, it, it you know, like I have 13 people in here right now. <laughs> and I know more will watch. And usually if I talk about Rose, you know, I'll get probably a thousand watches. But, um, he had 7,200 in there hearing this crap, you know, about Chris's dad. And, and I hear that a lot now. Oh, Chris's dad was a truck driver. Rose's car was found at a truck stop. His dad probably had something to do with it. Did anybody question his dad? His dad, his dad was out of state. <laughs> I mean, his dad was cleared right away. He had a logbook. They know where his dad was. So... Yes. Oh, yeah. Okay, so. Thirty miles from her house. Okay, apparently there was no discovery of her car keys. He had that right, anyway. Um, okay, she's Mary's Chris Lar, and then he goes, CL. He almost called you by name, Chris. Um, in 2009, and he is the father of their two children, their two daughters, who, by the way, are much older now. Really? Okay. Got that right, too. Um, four months into the marriage, we have a little secret life coming up. And that is when the Popo, who calls him Popo, is called to their house in a domestic as a result of some arguing. Okay, as a result of some arguing, we know we've got a lot of things happening here. Um, so now he tries to compare this to um, the Brian Laundry case. Um, and how we have a domestic and the victim, Rose, except Rose wasn't the victim, reports that her husband put her in a headlock and slams her to the ground. Later, he says concrete. You slammed her into the concrete, Chris. Um, 
However, later they reconcile and kind of smooth everything out. There are no more issues. And somehow the petition of the domestic disturbance gets withdrawn and pulled from the court system. Um, yeah, after 10 years it did. It didn't get really withdrawn. They closed out the file. I don't think he knows anything about the legal system either. So as a result of that, there are no domestic violence charges. But later on, we find out that she actually had a bench warrant. Um, what's one of the interesting things here that I want to ask you guys um, is sounds like we saw a press conference where somebody said, you know, well, she's apologized and everything's okay. So that's where it, um, he tries to say it's like um, Popo. <laughs> okay, so. Shortly after this event, the husband files for divorce, and according to him, statements in the public, Rose talks him out of it, so he wants out of the relationship. She wants to stay in the relationship. So now what I need, what we need to do in this scenario is, oh, his board. He wants to put red flags, two, huge red flags, because two people in a domestic, the 5-0 have been called. And everything just starts hunky-dory. Then she gets an active bench warrant, though, and now have everybody has to understand. I mean, we know how it works in the system. So she's declaring that he got her in a headlock and slammed her into the concrete. Okay, here. And then he's claiming that, no, it's all a misunderstanding. And, you know, she's pulled everything back and it's all good. But apparently she gets a bench warrant for disorderly conduct, which was later amended to a domestic. So it's unclear to me if you know how our charge was related uh, to this domestic incident. Um, if anybody has any insight, it's, it's the same incident, Chris. I don't know if you guys are going... <laughs> Getting tired about me talking about this, but um, it's the same incident. It was a a disorderly conduct with a domestic violence amendment to it. Later, he says she pled guilty, and that didn't happen either. Okay, so it's a misdemeanor in California. That would be a felony. Um. There and hey, we know our friends. We know recently that, um, oh, the officers have no choice but to hook people up and take them to jail. Um, so back then in 2009, those laws may not have been enacted in Wisconsin and they still had discretion. No, actually, they did hook up the person responsible and took her to jail. So I, I don't know why he's saying this. So anyway. A bench warrant is out in 2009. No. Her court date is in 2009. And she didn't show up because she went missing. Um, so she pleads guilty to misdemeanor domestic violence in court. No, she doesn't. Okay. All right, Kay, Dan, I will. <laughs> I get so worked up over this because there's so many errors in this and he, uh, um, it's not that he's lying, but that it's just lack of professionalism and research and anything to do with what he's doing. He should never have even talked about this and she doesn't plead guilty. First, he tells us it was dismissed. Then he decides there's two separate incidents and how are they related? Now she pleads guilty to domestic violence. No, she doesn't. According to the record, she may have been the aggressor. Actually, she was at that time. And a result of that, she may have been trying to dance her way around the relationship. 
And he was trying to maybe position himself as the victim. Um, I'm not clear how that works yet in this particular case, because only one of the two is missing and has been missing for quite some time. Okay, so what nobody seems to say about this. Just a minute. I don't get why Mark. Thank you, Melissa, but it doesn't. I know. Yeah, people people blocked me on Facebook, too, in the group I was in because I would point out facts. And yeah, they say I'm attacking people. I'm a know-it-all. No, I just, when you're wrong, you're wrong. I, I don't call people stupid, but I just say no that, you know, this is the law or this is a fact or. This is what happened. And yeah, exactly. There, that doesn't get talked about is the fact that Chris's dad was there and was a witness to this. And remember, he's not going to take Rose's, Chris's side over Rose because his, he had a relationship with Rose, you know, before Chris. Are right at the same time. I mean, she lived with his dad and Chris lived elsewhere at the beginning. So, yeah. And Rose is actually the one that called the cops, although they told her not to, that she was going to be arrested. So, Chris's dad had to hold her in a bear hug until the cops got there because that's how out of control she was. So, it, it wasn't a he said, she said. I mean, there was a witness. Right. Oh, yeah. No, I'm not saying, no, not an inappropriate relationship. Uh, Chris lived with, um, Rose lived with Chris's dad to take care of his horses because she was a big horse nut. Okay, so, yeah, so he's saying, oh, well, yeah, more red flags, bingo cards, whatever. Um. On August 9th, the night she disappeared. I don't think it was the 9th, was it? Chris? Anyway, she left home after they had dinner with his dad. And he and his dad were the last two people to see her alive. His dad wasn't there again, once again. Um, okay, so then he plays another video. I can't remember what that one is. Oh, this is the one with. Uh, candy. Okay, now he's saying um, she's lost. This was the video that the sheriff's department did with um, Candy talking about the loss of Rose and how her life was never the same. And he's saying, oh, well, I've got to stop for a second. What are the odds of Two moms in the same family losing their daughters. Um, yeah, Millie. Well, really? I didn't know that was your birthday. I guess I never looked into it. Okay, so. Here we look at the victim continuum. What the hell is that? Now, in Summer's case, five-year-olds just don't vanish. Um, actually, they do. Look at Dior Kuntz. He just vanished right into thin air. Look at Michael Vaughn. Uh, kids vanish all the time. But in Rose's case, she could vanish. But then you start to look at the environment, situation, and circumstances. But, Chris, you didn't do that. You haven't looked into anything. <laughs> I guess he's just... Waiting for his chat to clue him in. Okay, what do I got? Oh, so family dynamics on both place scenarios. So we can understand why that law enforcement is keeping it close to the vest. No, they just didn't want you to know anything about it. Um, there is generational stuff going on here. And I think we all know, you know, some of the players around. Only's talking about Don, of course, his arch enemy. But 
Don never met Rose and has nothing to do with this case. So tonight we will be focusing on correlating factors here in the secret life. Okay, Chris. Um <laughs> I know I, I I'm going by the transcript and you know Chris, he talks kind of choppy, so that's why it sounds like I don't know how to pronounce words correctly. He doesn't just say a simple sentence. Okay. Uh allegedly, in my opinion, you've got all the makings for a very high risk environment for Rose, just in some of the circles around this person. So let's continue on. Okay, so then it shows um pictures of the wedding, family that came, friends. Okay. Okay, and it's talking about Candy saying how she avoids this area. Yeah, I don't really understand that too because she, what area is she avoiding? Um, do you know that, Chris? Yeah, they're not. They're not connected. Well, he he would have loved to have tied Don into this too if he could have. Um. That bad. Yeah. Yeah, I don't either. But anyway, he said that's another red flag. Put that on the red flag train. Because he thinks that um, she would want to hang out in the area where she saw where Rose disappeared. Except that she doesn't know where Rose disappeared. I don't know. He didn't like that part of it either. So we agree with that anyway. So here's where he says the guy in the back seat of the truck filming candy driving is one of the investigators. I think the guy in the back seat was one of the investigators. I don't know who it is yet. We're certainly going to ask. <laughs> but I think the dude in the back seat is listening to what we call spontaneous statements. He thinks that there's a sheriff's detective in the back listening to try to trip up Candy in case she says anything shady. It was actually the um, cameraman and the microphone guy. That's who was in the back seat. It wasn't a detective. I mean, is this guy really a, a super cop? <laughs> Um, seriously. Okay, so, yep, he wants to apply things from, at this point, let's see. I don't think at this point the two cases are related. I think from one case to the next, they've learned some things that could be applied in case number two. Okay, so he is saying they're related. He's saying the same people are involved. Um, okay, he doesn't like, he, okay, he compares this to when he heard that his son <clears throat> had died and how he needed to go back to the place where it happened um, to get closure. Well, that's fine, Chris, but you're saying what? Because the situation with that would be he was saying he was at Disneyland by the teacups when he got the phone call and he had to go back there to get closure to it. So it's not like Candy needed to go back to where Rose was last seen. She would go back to where she was when she got the phone call, right? That's that would be the situation that he's describing. Yeah, well, you didn't get any exclusive. 
interviews about this. Oh, Squirrely Girl thinks that that corner thing is funny. <laughs> Clicks and views. Exactly. Exactly, Millie. Yes. And you know the shed thing. I mean, he did all that. He orchestrated it. It was like theater for him. Okay. And he's directing it. Um, like when he went down to the shed and, you know, asked Candace if he could look in the shed. Okay. The shed door is partially open anyway. Right. And Candace said, well, yeah, I wouldn't want you to get hurt. And so Chris backed away. So now he's still claiming to this day that Candace told him he could not go in the shed. I heard him. I think even in this, he said, well, you know, I was denied being able to look in the shed. He knew that Don was not there. Don's truck was not there. Chris's wife was in the truck in the driveway waiting while he did this. He deliberately did not even peer in the open doorway so that he could try to intimate that Don was hiding in the shed. I don't know. Chris has a shed fetish. So Don hid in the shed once when he lived in Utah when he was a kid. And now suddenly Chris thinks that Don likes to hide in sheds. What? Does that even make any sense to anybody at all? Um, okay. I'm sure I'm going to be the topic of the lab after dark tonight. But anyway, been there before. <laughs> um, oh, yeah, supposedly. Yeah, he's got a bunch of interviews he's doing in Wisconsin, and he's going to talk about this more next week. Um, he can't figure out how they've only been married a few months and have two kids. So he's still talking about what a mystery that is. <laughs> um, and Candy is uh, using a walking stick or a cane in the video for Rose. But we haven't seen her use the walking stick in Summer's case. What? <laughs> I don't know. Okay, so here we go back to the um, the car it was found 30 miles away. And it's an area, according to law enforcement and public reports, an area where there's a large presence of truck drivers. No, it wasn't. And it was a parking lot that had a lot of transient activity, according to all projected sources. What sources, Chris? What sources? A lot of transient activity. You mean the residents of Grantsburg that were going to the post office? That kind of transient activity? <laughs> well, I think that in and of itself could be very interesting. It could be something that is a red herring. That her car, in and of itself, a suspect... Uh, was fun four days later like it was a plant. So why plant a car, hypothetically, if this is a plan? Why put it in an area with such high transient traffic? Um, make it look like Rose left. Well, now we don't know if it's CL. Well, we don't know could have done that. However, that is why it throws a whole bunch of red flags up into the air. He really likes his red flags. Yeah, he has a shed fetish. He has a shed fetish, definitely. Okay, so... They're trying to make it look like she leaves her car, gets into somebody else's car. Well, that's a high-risk activity. So she's a victim of opportunity at that point, and that's where the stranger abduction theory would come in. Now, we know in Summer's case, I'm not buying that. Yeah, we know that, Chris. 
we know what you think happened in Summer's case. You've made that very clear. Um, okay, so then he talks about the difficulty of dropping the car off. You'd need two people, someone to follow you, someone to give you a ride. Or you get into a trucker's truck and take off. Um, what? Random abduct abduction is very, 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 very rare in 2009. So now you have a family who has experienced a loved one disappear, absolutely 100% disappear. So she plans, according to her husband, and remember, his father is there. We've not heard much about his father. I'm going to look into that a little bit deeper to find out what circle of influence is in that. His father wasn't there. Did I mention that his father wasn't there? <clears throat> okay. So she leaves to go visit, allegedly, her cousin at a local bar. But later her cousin says, I don't know what you're talking about. She doesn't have any recognition, recollection of that, according to reports. So apparently she kind of something, the drink story that they were going to meet up 15 minutes from her house. And yet the car is found another 15 minutes from that meetup spot. So 30 miles away, that in itself sounds kind of, you know, strange. That is true. Her cousin said that she did not have plans to meet her. Although her cousin did say that she had covered for Rose in previous situations. So. Rose wasn't actually gone that long. When did she leave, Chris? Nine. Was it 9.30? Oh, okay. Well, here's another red flag. Two so far, and we've got a couple going on here now. Could she have been cheating? Yeah, of course she could have been. However, that relationship has turned into a mystery. It's still in her investigation. And now we have to correlate that to a second family member of a five-year-old little girl who just vanished out of a basement. The two have nothing to do with one another. Yes, seven. Yes. Absolutely 100%. And Josh likes to take up for Chris. You know the, when, um, it wasn't Tennessee Truth, was it Toaster Oven? Jenkies, remember at that fair, the Baileytown Fair, where they had that tent set up for missing people? And then Chris made fun of that, Chris McDonough, um, and accused them of having hanging pictures of missing kids that were already found so that they could claim that they did that. And then people got after him for, you know, mocking that. And Josh, you know. Was all over it. Of course, Chris didn't apologize or anything, but Josh went on and said, Oh, you know, Chris didn't mean that. Chris didn't, no, he didn't mean that. He didn't say that. Yes, he did. It's on, it's on YouTube. <sighs> Millie, I really do think the paranoia, I think he really believed Don was in the shed. No, he said that he wasn't. No, Don. He knew Don wasn't there. Okay, Don. Don's truck was gone. And he said that. He told someone that. He laughed um, because they said something about how he left his wife alone in the truck with, uh, you know, Don running loose. Yeah, well, he's he's left a lot of wreckage in his wake. And I'm going to be bringing that out. Okay, so here. 
Um, last reported contact she made was to her husband telling him she'd be home around midnight. This is according to the husband. So apparently she makes contact with the husband and says, I'll be home at midnight. So she's supposed to be out with her cousin at this point. If that was to line up, because she would think the husband would say, well, you know, where are you? Are you having a good time with your cousin that you were going to meet for drinks? So there's another red flag. The thing is, she called in um, shortly after she left the house while she was still driving. Because I know I did question that, too. All right. Now what's wrong with my phone? Okay. So then the FBI has issued a wanted person's bulletin about her. And he said he calls this horsepower. And then he uh, puts a... Um, a blip in about his good friend Coop who started that VICAP thing whatever so actually we're supposed to thank him but the stuff that's on that is wrong um, let's see what happened in the house before Rose left or did she leave the house um, he's just speculating. He's just speculating here. About things that he doesn't know anything about. I mean, if you're going to speculate, you at least find out the facts and then try to fit a theory around that, right? So I don't know if there have been any search warrants in the house. Yeah, you don't know that. Um, I'm assuming the car was hit pretty cleanly. Assume. He's assuming. <laughs> and if the car was in the husband's name, that he could have given consent to search the house or the car. And Chris told me... That... Uh, they did. He gave consent to search the house, but they did uh, have a warrant, which is, you know, usually the case. They ask you if you can search to see what you say, but then they have a warrant ready anyway. Um, I don't know why he thinks the car was hit cleanly. The car was in Rose and Chris's dad's name. Chris bought it for her. So, I mean, Chris's dad bought it for her. So now he's talking about, you know, he doesn't know if they um, that the house was searched or not. If they didn't search it, that was a big mistake. So then he talks about Chris filing for a divorce. Um, her husband of six months files for divorce. They requested a court order to ensure Rose could not return and gain custody of their children. So the children seem to be a pivotal piece of this puzzle for the husband. Remember, he wants out of the relationship. She allegedly talks him back into it. But he wants custody of the children in case she comes back. So he files divorce and says, you know, I need to get custody of these kids. So let's add that to the red flag column, shall we? Okay, whatever. In 2010, he was granted sole custody of their daughters. Um, temporary sole custody. And it was in the order that if Rose came back, they would revisit custody. So this was just a temporary thing. So she couldn't come back and take the girls. His lawyer recommended that. It's not a red flag. It wasn't even Chris's idea. Um, oh, then we're talking about things that were on a Facebook group. Although he hasn't seen that. And he doesn't, you know, get into that. You know, I like to stay neutral. <laughs> 
Who knew this was going to be a funny part? And Rose said her husband told her that if he ever left her, she would never take the girls. He got that from a Facebook group that he didn't see. Okay. So um, here, the girls are older. I'm hoping at some point, Chris will talk to me and we can get a little better understanding of what the conditions were that evening. So if anybody knows him, have him reach out to me. I'd love to talk to him and see if we can correlate some things. So according to some of the reports at the time, samples were taken of DNA from her Pontiac. Actually, it was not in the car, but they weren't definitive enough to generate a person of interest. See, the, this shows you how little he knows about the case right here. Um, so then he starts talking about the Suzanne Morphew case. Let's see, didn't he try to get involved in that too? I didn't follow that case, so I don't know. And uh, then he's talking about a life insurance policy on the wife. So he doesn't have an answer to that yet in this case. Um, no, Chris is not going <laughs> to. Chris is not going to speak to him. Yes, Millie, she absolutely was. Drugs are at the heart of this case. Um, well, the uh, pot, I don't know if she was addicted to meth, but meth is what got her killed. I can say that. Um. There was no life insurance on Rose. And is Chris aware that you actually need a body to claim a life insurance policy? Um, he doesn't seem to be, but... <laughs> yeah, that wouldn't work out very good. And you know what? See, they morph you. Um, yeah, no. I mean, that body was hidden, too, so... Usually, you have the body found somewhere if you got life insurance on it. Um, okay, here. Uh, yeah, this is definitely an avenue we wanted to take a look at. Um, the life insurance. He's going to look into that. And... Uh, <laughs> He wants to help the sheriff. Okay, so here's one interesting tidbit. Rose, Rose tells her mom. Tidbit, Annabelle, not titbit. Rose tells her mom, Candy, that she fell off a horse and was experiencing pain. That was true. And he calls her grandest. I do not call her grandest. Candy grabbed that later and interjected that into her story that maybe she suffered from brain damage and wandered off on her own. All right. But a cop said there's no evidence of that theory. And then he got a phone call. Whatever. So now he's saying that, uh, oh, Millie, uh, it is awful. This is awful. And just think, 7,200 people think that this is fact. Um, okay, so he's saying this is another red flag because uh, Candy said that um, Rose just could have wandered off. And so now, in Summer's case, if we take a look at some of the correlations to what we know happened to Summer, I think one of the comments was that she could have wandered off. And that in itself is another red flag. It is? What? <laughs> okay. Um... Okay, then he's talking about touch DNA, how maybe they could use that in the car. The car's long gone. 
he's assuming that they um uh that they really chucked out the car okay we already know they didn't because once chris's dad got the car back the green sweater that's on all the uh vicap and missing persons posters that she was allegedly wearing was in the car so why the hell didn't the cops see that if they process the inside of the car and they're saying there's no dna and only family fingerprints um why didn't they see a sweater in the car anybody got an answer for that <laughs> so yeah i am i'm gonna get in trouble for this aren't i okay so then he um inexplicably switches over to don wells and his three prison terms don wells does not have three prison terms and one of them was robbing a convenience store with a gun really no <laughs> i don't i don't think i want to get off onto the utah don wells thing um okay where was dw living when rose went missing i've heard different things my best recollection is he may have been in arkansas at the time um was there ever evidence proof that rose actually fell off a horse yes there was rose did fall off a horse um chris told me it wasn't <laughs> he doesn't know anything. <sighs> there you go, Chris. There's a question for you. Um, if she, a personality change, I don't even think she still had headaches and this is my opinion but why would you say you're going out to do karaoke if you had headaches i don't think you would um yeah he said she was barrel training the horse and fell off so okay how old was candace when this happened so there's an eight year difference between the two girls. So she was eight years older than Rose. No, there's two years difference between each of the girls. So she's six, where is he getting this? Okay, next is the rumor about the family reunion around the time of the disappearance rumor. Um, I have not heard that rumor and I do not know that answer. And if it's a rumor, we want to verify that, really? Um, and then he starts talking about Wayne Gretzky. <laughs> Pretty sure Wayne Gretzky didn't have anything to do with this either. Okay, so what happened to Rose? Well, at this point, I don't know yet, outside of she's definitely not with us. Could be foul play in the realm of possibility. Uh, most definitely, obviously, uh, it doesn't, you know, take much to say other than that. So I think her life was taken, um, you know, the demise. I don't think she walked away. I think the domestic stuff is problematic. And at this point, I would put her in the category of, um, you know, she could be a victim of foul play. <laughs> is he still alive? Okay. Um, should I keep going? Still got a couple people in here. Okay, so, oh yeah, here we go. Now he wants, um, the car could be problematic. The car could be staged. Um, it was dropped off there. 
What does he think could be staged about it? I mean, they had to get rid of it, right? Okay, so uh, if we were approached, we being the Cold Case Foundation, by the sheriff or Grandish, <laughs> we could get involved in Rose's case and we could hit the ground running with about 125 folks from top to bottom. And we have some conversations taking place next week. I'll keep you posted. Okay, Eve, thanks. Is it past your bedtime? You can go if you need to, hon. Take care of you, sweetie. Um, in this case, it sounds like it was just standard VICAP. Missing person, mother of two, so boots on the ground. Um, in this, you have to ask everybody in the circle, including the father-in-law, who was one of the last two people to see her. Um, I would really like to talk to the father-in-law. There you go, Chris. Um, I don't know. My gut tells me he's not, you know, not with us anymore because it's been over 10 years. <laughs> I don't think he needs to listen to his gut. It doesn't seem very reliable. Um, and, you know, I hope he is because he would be one of the first guys I would start with, you know, to see what he has to say. Um, and you have to do it, you know, separately, right? You want to do it out of the earshot of every other family member. <laughs> Oh, and then he brags on himself how he was the second to last person to interview Wesley and Dad, uh, the serial killer. What does that have to do with anything? Okay. Then <laughs> we have the chat. Oh, Millie, um, <laughs> Eve, you're funny. Yes, she went to a party that night with her meth friends. Um, and she didn't st stay too long at that party. There was a lot of witnesses. Um, things have been reported. I posted a confidential informant report that told what happened to her. Um, and I know there's at least two other confidential informant reports that told the same thing. So there's three. And um, a couple of other people that claimed that they were there too. So I don't understand why it's not going anywhere. Wonder where he got all his info? I guess his gut. Yeah. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I love you, Millie. <laughs> Um, could Larson dump the car there to make it look like Rose Loft? That was one of the questions in the chat. I'm surprised nobody saw the car being parked or the person who parked it at that truck stop. You know, I think about that too. Now, there was cameras in two directions there, but whoever parked the car there avoided both of those cameras. So I'll post a picture of the parking lot and the entrances and everything. It's it's a pretty small lot. Um, maybe 12 spots, I think. Um, yeah, it's just definitely odd that, yeah, there were no witnesses, I think, to when that car was dropped off. Because there had to be another person to take the person that drove it away. Um, Millie, they were Chris, tell me again. Okay, seven seven and eighteen months. Seven months and eighteen months. But you know, the theory that Chris's dad was a truck driver, um, and they put Chris's 
and that's a trucker's parking lot. And so they had uh, Rose's car in the back of the truck. And then they took that and dropped the car off at the parking lot. Like th a truck wouldn't even fit in that parking lot. And you're not going to attract any attention unloading a car with a, a drop gate and a forklift in the middle of a little parking lot. No, that didn't happen. <laughs> um, I don't know. I think be, so it would be found, K. Dan. At that point, they needed it found. Um, I've heard of a place that might have been that was pretty secluded in a barn, not too far from the house where the party was at, by someone who was at the party that was running that house and barn. And I heard it was kept there for four days. But then what are they going to do with it? They got to put it somewhere. You know, putting it in that parking lot it could make it look like she met someone else, right? Like she parked it there. I don't know. Somebody's got those keys. I think. Keys make a good trophy. Okay, let's see what else. Did Rose ever leave the house? I hope the police checked the property. I think all the families involved are criminally minded. This is from the chat. Um, did she actually leave the house? She actually did leave the house because she called Chris um, and told him she'd be home at midnight. And the phone records did back that up. Chris was home and got the call. Rose did call him from her cell phone. So she did leave the house. Um, but of course, Chris McDonough wouldn't know any of that. Two females missing in the same family. Very, very odd. Um, yes, it's unusual. It's not totally rare. And I have gathered several cases of two people in a family missing. Um, two brothers that went missing five or six years apart and were never found. Look at... Um, uh, Cassidy Rainwater, which was last year, the year before. And uh, I think those last guy was just sentenced for that. They filmed her, kidnapped her, kept her in a cage in the basement, tortured her, cut her up, whatever. Her mother um, went missing 10 years before that. So it does happen. I just think in this case, um, you know, in this case, super, you know, social media sleuths, I don't know. They're trying to connect every case on YouTube, like, you know, Upchurch connecting Riley Strain and Kylie Rodney. Um, there was a creator that said the West boys, Cash Gernon, uh, I forget all these different people were all by the same group. They're kind of like the smiley face, you know, and I wanted to do a show about the smiley face killers too, because that's such a far out theory in my opinion. Thanks, hon. Appreciate it. Okay, here's somebody um, wondering if one of them had a secret place they tricked Summer and Rose to go. What? Um, 
so glad someone is talking about Summer and Rose. Thank you, Chris, for bringing sanity back to YouTube. I had to read that. I know it's a cheap shot, but okay. Um, hope law enforcement is taking a hard look at Marcos. Okay, Marcos is Chris Marcos was also mentioned as a suspect in Summer Wells' case. Uh, he is Candy's nephew, step nephew, and married her niece. So he's kind of a doubly related to the family person. He is a very dangerous, violent sex offender of children. And um, so that's a legitimate concern. However, Chris Marcos was living in California when Rose went missing. Um, and he was at work in Wisconsin on camera. He manages a uh, party store gas station or something. And there were several coworkers that vouch for him and he was on video. Um, so he was nowhere near summer. And I'm sure that there is uh, little girls closer to Wisconsin than Tennessee. But, you know, that was that was legitimate that people wanted. But to still be talking about that, you know, three years later, still people are like, oh, Marcos. Um, okay, so here's the VICAP alert for Rose. And it says, was last seen leaving her residence in St. Croix Falls, Wisconsin, en route to Cushing. Nobody ever said she was going to Cushing, and we don't know where they even got that. Um, a distance of five miles. I actually think it's more like 12, isn't it, Chris? Her car was recovered five days later in Grantsburg in a parking lot typically used by truck drivers to park their tractor trailers. Um, this is on the FBI VICAP. So, what the hell? I don't know. I'm just, I'm just... And still, to this day, that poster has um, contact number and email for a detective that no longer works there. Hasn't worked there in a long time. Um, Lisa Ditlison was the lead investigator in Rose's disappearance. And she was later sued for ignoring evidence. And um, convicting a man of sexual assault on a child. And he sued. And it was overturned. Um, because he was innocent. There was evidence that proved that. And uh, she, you know, had qualified immunity because she was law enforcement. Um, she was also in charge of the evidence room at the time. And uh, she now sells real estate. So, shady. What can I say? Shady, shady, shady. All the way around. Okay, so this is a lot longer than I usually go. Um, you know, we can talk about this more later. Anytime anybody has any questions, feel free. You know, and Chris... Chris is um, always around if we're going to talk about Rose. And now that he's a legal expert, maybe, maybe he'll always be here for Tuesday legal cases. Thank you, Kay Dan. I appreciate that. I appreciate all of your, um, all of your comments always. Oh, he's definitely, yeah. <laughs> Okay, so um, we're going to wrap it up. And now I'm bleeding because my cat just clawed me. Um, so love all you guys. I really do. I appreciate each and every one of you. You don't know how much and how much I enjoy, you know, you guys being in chat. 
and leaving comments and interacting. Um, hey, you know, when I monetized, so that was supposed to bring my videos up on more channels or whatever, on more feeds. I've made $10. <laughs> $10.16. Just wanted you to know. In case you wanted to call me a tragedy pimp. <laughs> um, thanks, Squirrely Girl. Thanks, Bob. Thanks, Kay Dan. Chris. Millie. Oh, yeah. Yes, it does. Depending on how far back you go. Um, Eve, the lovely Eve, moderator extraordinaire, and Annabelle. I didn't see Rakes tonight. Good night, Melissa Brown. And I know Misha is watching the replay. So, love you guys. And um, I will not have a show on Thursday because I'm going to be out of town. I put on retreats out of state and i have one this week this week and this weekend so um i'll see y'all next tuesday so have a good week and a good weekend and i'll see you then thanks everybody for being here